Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having the chance to be here with you tonight. I'm very impressed by the audience. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to contribute to the Kapuczynski lecture. And I'm very glad that Maya Bucha, a, a colleague of mine, has been preparing all uh, this event. I'm very grateful for that, Maya. I brought with me a discussion paper which has been published yesterday in our institute. Uh, you worked it out because you have been a guest researcher in our institute this summer, so thank you very much. It is, it is from the press, it's still warm, on science technology for development. So this is a very important issue. We'll see that science and development has something to do with what I would like to talk about uh, tonight also. So thank you very much. I'm really delighted and uh, appreciate to be here. So, what would I like to do during the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes? I would like to talk about global development issues. I would like to bring together poverty reduction because this is the essence of international development cooperation. But I would like to bring together the poverty reduction issue with the planetary boundaries. So, the boundaries of our Earth system. Because, as you will see, in the short term, I am very optimistic, actually, in terms of economic and social development around the world. In the medium and long term, I see many challenges, the planetary boundaries. This is why I think that we need to, to organize a, a more long-term framework for international cooperation towards a great terms transformation, towards sustainability. And you will see why this is, from my perspective, so important. I have been organizing this lecture around four issues. I will start with the MDGs, making progress. I said that I'm optimistic here, and I will show you a series of data demonstrating that in terms of poverty reduction, economic and social development, we see progress in many parts of the world. This is an interesting development path which we are on, on the one hand side. I will then come to what I call the four fundamentals of civilization of human civilization under stress. This is related with the planetary boundary issue. And you will see what I do have in mind with these four fundamentals which we need to get right in order to make economic and social progress worldwide sustainable. I will then come to a third point. It, this is about what I call tectonic power shifts. You all know the debates on China and India and all the other rising stars. What this, does this imply for global development? And I will focus briefly on that. And then finishing with some elements for a new development paradigm which is needed toward this transformation towards sustainability. Maybe I should tell you that I'm uh, also vice-chairing the German Advisory Council on Global Change. We are in Germany the climate people, the climate advisors to our government. We are currently writing a study on how to decarbonize, so greenhouse gases, bringing down them by 80 to 90 percent towards 2050, 2060 in Europe. What does this mean? And part of what I'm telling you here is part of this kind of work which, which I'm doing in the climate arena also. Okay, so let's get started. The first point is let's start optimistically. Let's start with good news. So where are the good news in terms of MDG's poverty reduction is making progress. Here the first most important data is that in absolute terms, or in, 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 in terms of absolute poverty around the world, these are people living with less than one dollar a day. We had 46% of the global population in 1990 in this category. Half, more or less half, only 20 years ago. Nowadays, we do have 27% of the global population in this category of being absolutely poor, less than one dollar a day. So this is a very interesting development which we can see here. You can look at this diagram and you will observe that in all regions around the world, poverty is going down in relative terms. And this is good news. In some regions faster, East Asia for example, than in others, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, but also in Africa we see progress. So the group of people of the, in the world population living under conditions of absolute poverty is going down. The second thing, the second diagram here is also about the MDGs. So it is about extreme poverty, hunger, gender issues, child mortality, 
and where the column is orange, we, do, we are on track in terms of achieving the goal. Where you do see, for example, MDG4, child mortality, this half and half column, we are not on track. The message here is that in many areas we are already on track. In some areas we are not on track in terms of fighting absolute poverty. For example, child mortality and maternal mortality, these are areas where we are not making progress. These are systemic areas also. You know, to get, to get people, young, to get children into schools is relatively easy. You build schools and bring people to schools. But to improve the health system is a systemic issue. It needs more time. But in general terms, in many areas we are on track. We are going to have areas of success regarding global poverty reduction. Here we have success countries in the poverty reduction process. So the MDG best performers in least developed countries. And what you can see here, what is important is that also African countries are making progress. Part of the African countries are star performers in terms of reducing poverty. This is an important issue because very often Africa is per perceived per se as a crisis continent. This is not the case. You see here Benin, Mali, Ethiopia, Gambia, Malawi, uh, Ghana uh, and Togo, countries which are successfully reducing poverty. This is good, good news also from Africa. So progress also uh, in this respect. There is another good news in terms of poverty reduction issues. 50% of the, what Paul Collier, a colleague uh, of us, a UK colleague, what he calls the bottom billion, so the billion people living in absolute poverty, half of this bottom billion is living in China and in India. Uh, 500 million people of the billion people. This is also actually good news because these economies are growing fast. So the chance to bring the numbers of poor people down in China and in India is of course easier than in Congo, for example, where the situations are much more, the situation is much more uh, challenging. So it is good news that half of the poor people on earth live in this biggest countries on earth which are rapidly growing. So we have a chance to bring the numbers of poor people down there. This is a, next, a second, a third very important good news. Here you do have a hunger map to say so. And what you can see is the red countries here. In the red countries, uh, hunger is still growing. In all the other regions and countries, hunger is reducing. And what you can see here is, is from 1990 to 2010, we only have two or three countries where hunger is still growing. This is Congo, Zimbabwe and North Korea. Congo, Zimbabwe and North Korea. So these are very difficult countries, as you know. But in all the other countries, we see success in terms of fighting poverty. This is a picture which shows you how the world regions grow in the mid of the economic crisis. It's 2010 and the projections for 2011. And the important issue here is, the important thing here is that developing countries also in sub-Saharan Africa <coughs> are growing faster than in the OECD countries. Where you see these blue, dark blue regions and countries, these are countries growing with growth rates beyond 5%. So, Sub-Saharan Africa, have a look. Many countries are growing with 5% and even more. This implies that in the financial crisis, many developing countries are decoupling themselves from this economic recession. This is very interesting because when the crisis began in 2008 and 9, I myself wrote articles that the saying that the developing countries will hit most. This is not the case. This has to do with China with India, with Asia, because these countries are growing because they are exporting heavily towards Asia and Asia is growing fast. You see here high growth rates in China, in India, in other Asian countries. So Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of growth is on an interesting path, on an interesting path. I will tell you afterwards that there are fragilities too, of course, but the growth rates are interesting. So this is a graph from the OECD Development Center in Paris. 
the red countries here in 1990, this is a, is a map from 1990, these are the poor countries, the red ones. Now I will show you the 2010 map and then you will see that the group of countries, of poor countries, not meeting the MDGs is shrinking, is becoming smaller. Have a look on that. This is the new map of 2010. This is the old map of, two, of 1990. So many sub-Saharan African countries are also becoming countries which grow out of poverty currently. This is very good news. At the end of the day, we do have 34 countries on earth which are not on track in terms of fighting poverty successfully. 22 of those 35 countries are fragile states, are war countries, are conflict countries. This is a very important message because at the beginning of this century, hard poverty and security and bad governance and conflict are coming together. The other countries seem to have a chance in the context of globalization to grow out of poverty. This is important news. If we talk about the MDG agenda, fighting poverty, in the future, this group is the most important one. And this group is at the same time the most difficult one. Because we know that in countries like Somalia, Congo, Afghanistan also, it is so difficult to stabilize the political systems and to bring poverty down. But these are the most challenging, challenging countries in terms of poverty reduction. Most of the other countries are on an interesting path. This is important to recognize. So, if we talk about the MDG agenda, what we can say is that we see many countries growing out of poverty. We see a shrinking group of being still in the poverty trap, and those are conflict countries and failing states. But if we look towards the future, we also have to recognize two very important issues. The first issue is that the growth in the rapidly growing emerging economies like China and India, this growth is driven by fossil fuels still. And we all know that fossil fuels are, should, are pushing climate change and global warming. So the development path, the growth, growth path on which these countries are so successful in economic terms is not sustainable for all of us because it is fostering climate change. This is why I say it is not sustainable in the middle and long term. These countries have to go to a low carbon development path as we have to do that in Europe and elsewhere in the industrialized world. So this is the first thing. They are not sustainable because it is fossil driven. The second thing is that the African countries are growing and this is good news that they are growing. Latin American countries are also growing as we have been seen on this map there. But their, their growth is based on resources. They are exporting resources to the Asian countries. China is an important market there. India is an important market there. And resources are very difficult challenges for developing economies because resource exports are very often linked with corruption, with conflicts even. Prices are very volatile. So these countries need to learn how to manage resources well, make them sustainable, use them efficiently in order to translate resource-based growth in sustainable growth. And many of these resources are also very fragile, the planetary boundaries. In many areas, these resources are very scarce. So we need to learn in these countries to use these resources in a very efficient way and translate it in long-term development. Because we, we know so many countries, resource-rich, which are failing states. Most of the red countries, the poor countries which we have seen, are resource-rich. Congo is a resource-rich country. It failed because it is resource-rich. Many countries are resource-rich, Nigeria also, and very fragile. So, the sub-Saharan countries are growing, but they are growing on a fragile basis, which is resource-based, and we need to learn to manage that. The development cooperation might play a very interesting role there. Okay, so let's have now a longer term look. And I would go into the climate debate, because from my perspective, the climate issue is the single most important threat to human mankind, if we reflect on global development. 
And I will not go into the climate debate, although I like to talk about the climate issue and to explain why it is so important. I will not do that. I will translate the climate debate directly into a development debate. So let's imagine, and this is the path on which we are, let's imagine that we would go towards a global warming process which ends up with higher temperatures at the end of this century around 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. This is what we are currently pushing forward. So let's imagine that. And let's ask, I'll ask then, what does this imply for global development? And this is what I would like to focus on. And if we translate climate change issues and development issues, what I come up with are my four fundamentals of global civilization. My four fundamentals of global civilization. And these four fundamentals are the following ones. It is about soil and food because we all need to eat. This is very simple. And it is, it is about water, of course, because we all need water to survive. And then it is about energy, because without energy, an economy cannot grow and develop. We need energy. And it is, it is about a stable climate and a stable atmosphere, because if the climate and the atmosphere is not stable, we are running into tipping points in the Earth system. Tipping points in the Earth system. Only one sentence to that. When we would have a global warming towards 3 to 4 degrees Celsius until the end of the century, this would imply that the process of warming would be 100 to 200 times more rapid than the more, most rapid processes of changing temperatures we have ever seen on Earth. 100 to 200 times more rapid. This is as if you go with your car on the street and you are allowed to run 100 kilometers and what you do is, you do it by 10,000. This is 100 times more, 100,000, 10,000. So the time scale which we are moving on in terms of global warming is absolutely unprecedented in human history as such and in the Earth history as such. So these are the four by four fundamentals of human civilization, because we all need that. This is not only a challenge for developing countries, it is a challenge for all our countries. But it's, it is specifically important, of course, for poor countries, because in poor countries, people are very vulnerable in terms of the natural environment they need. 90% of the incomes of poor people around the world are based on natural resources. In our rich countries, only 30%. So they are more vulnerable when we, than we are. But these four fundamentals are important for the civilization of, uh, uh, as such. What I will do, do now with you is I will go through these four dimensions. And I will show you the trends which we have on the, in the global arena which we need to manage or to avoid wherever possible. And I think I will start with the atmosphere. I will. So, this is the atmosphere. Um, if we talk about climate change and we agree on trying to stop global warming around 2 degrees Celsius, this is what the international community agreed on in Copenhagen, on a paper which is not international law, but it is a paper, you know, 2 degrees. If we would agree on that, the question then is, how much greenhouse gases are we still allowed to, em to emit in the atmosphere? How much? And we calculated that. And we calculated that we do have a budget of 750 gigatons of greenhouse gases which we can still emit, emit to, the international, to the global atmosphere within the 2 degrees Celsius corridor. 750 gigaton. And with this 750 gigaton, we will achieve the 2 degrees Celsius degree by 67% probability. So now you will ask me why 67%, why not 90 or 100? And the answer is very easy. If you calculate it with 100% security to achieve the 2 degrees Celsius target, the budget which you come up with, which we can still emit in the atmosphere, is so small it is absolutely unmanageable. So we still have, we need, we need to calculate this risk and we suggest to work with 67% probability to reach this 2 degrees Celsius target, then we would have 
750 gigatons from now on to 2050. So now your question uh, is probably is this much or little or what is, seven, what is 750 gigatons? So the answer to that is if you would stabilize our greenhouse gas emissions on the level of 2008, which we are not doing, it's growing, if we would do that, this budget would be exhausted in 2030. So it is a small budget. We need to go down rapidly and radically. It is small. It is scarce. And I do have a second message regarding the climate stability issue. We also calculated, and you can see this here, uh, asking ourselves, when we peak the global, with the global emissions, when we peak with these global emissions in certain years, how fast do we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions afterwards? And we come up with this uh, curves here. If we would be able to peak with the greenhouse gas emissions in 2011, which is impossible because this is tomorrow morning, as you know, we would have the chance to reduce then the global emissions year by year by 3.7%. This is challenging but possible. We know these kind of efficiency gains by in labor productivity and energy productivity areas. But if we peak in 2020, in 10 years' time, we would need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions globally, year by year, by 9%. This is impossible. This is impossible technologically, uh, regarding our institutional change we would need, regarding costs which this was, um, would imply. So this graph shows that in terms of avoiding dangerous climate change, we are under high time pressure, under high time pressure. We need to peak as fast as possible. If not, it will become every day much more expensive to bring our emissions down. You can see that here. We need to peak before 2020. So this is about the climate stability arena, and this is why low carbon development must be key for all our economies, because high carbon growth is driving climate change. So let's go to the water pillar then. I have been talking about the climate issue and climate stability. So let's look, have a look on the water map because water is the second thing we all need to survive. This is a water map from 2007. Everything what is blue is nice, so a lot of water around. Everything what is red is very difficult, so we do have physical water problems here. And uh, fortunately, <coughs> only a few people are living in these red areas or the other way around, they are living relatively little people because there is no water. Huh? Then we do have sub-Saharan Africa, this is brown or something. This is not physical water. These are not physical water problems. These are what we call socio-economic water problems. It is about bad infrastructure. It is about people are not able to pay for the water. The water is there, but the water is not coming to the people. So these are developmental challenges. It's about infrastructure, technical help, financial issues, but the water is there. So if you look at this water map, we are living in a, on a blue planet. Well, that's what the planet is about. It's a blue planet. So let's have a look to the water map on the way towards a three to four degrees plus world, a mid-century. So for most of you, the younger people here, this is, um, this is part of your perspectives, of course. And this is the water map for 2040 and to, to, to 2070, the way on the global warming towards 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. And what you can see here is that we will see huge subcontinental or even continental water scarcity regions. And we have been seeing that in Latin America, today we do not have any problem. Water is everywhere and we will have so we will have sub-regional water problems in Latin America. And we have been seeing that in sub-Saharan Africa we do have socio-economic water problems. We will have massive physical water problems. So this is about water. If you go to your security people, to, you, to your defense people, uh, this is an urgent message because this implies that people will move away. This is about migration because people will leave places where they do not have access to water. This is why we need to avoid change, climate change dynamics towards or beyond 2 degrees Celsius. We need to avoid this scenario. We, can, we still can do that. Let's go to the third pillar of global civilization. The third pillar is about uh, soil. And soil is about um, 
is about food. It's about food security. And food is already becoming, without climate change, is becoming a scarce resource. We need to know that. We need to invest huge amounts of money in, in agricultural production around the world because we are becoming a world population of 9 billion people towards 2050. Currently we are 6.7 billion people. I have been born at the beginning of the 60s. We have been 3.5 billion people in these days. So we are rapidly growing. So there is, there is a, a pressure towards we need more land and food for more people. 9 billion people. We need also more land because people are becoming richer. And as people are becoming richer, this has been the good news at the beginning, they are copying our food production patterns, in the Western European ones. And our food production pattern is very land intensive. So we need more food anyway. So let's then put, uh, again, this kind of thing into the climate perspective. And what you can see here is processes of desertification driven by global warming. And the red areas are areas threatened by desertification. So agriculture will be very difficult in these red areas here. This affects uh, southern Africa, but also southern Europe, as you can see, parts of Latin America, the southern parts of the US. So desertification is a major trend here towards the end of this century in the world becoming warmer around 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. And there is a second very important trend. This is not about, about desertification. It is about soil degradation, which is different. What is soil degradation? Soil degradation is this. You see here the map of China, and you see that in the northwestern part of China, it is becoming warmer than in the rest of the country. This has to do with geography. So we will see heat waves in the west, west, uh, northwestern part of China, and at the same time, these heat waves will be combined with strong precipitation patterns, so strong rainfalls. And heat waves and strong rainfalls result into degradation of soil. So this is what we are going to see in many parts of the world. You can see this here on this map uh, in the red areas. And beyond the desertification regions, which we have been seeing, the most important issue here is that China and India are becoming critical countries from this perspective. So. Global warming will threaten food security in many countries and regions around the world. This is the third pillar of global civilization. Climate stability, water, soil, and food. So let's go to the last one. The last one is about energy. I said that without energy there is no development. So what is the problem here? The problem is that the energy system we do have globally is driving climate change. So it is driving the threats which we have been seeing before. This implies that we have to reorganize our global energy system, also in many developing countries. So our global energy system currently is based by 85% on fossil fuels and 15% on non-fossil fuels. This is what you can see here, 2010. And what we need towards 2070 is exactly the other way around. We need a global energy system based by 15% on fossil fuels and 85% on non-fossil fuels. So this is a huge transformation that we need to organize, not only in the industrialized world, also in the rapidly growing emerging countries, even in sub-Saharan Africa, because we all need to go no fossil. If not, we are running into the threats we have been seeing before. So this is the business as usual path towards 2100. This is a six degree uh, Celsius warmer planet. So this is what we need to avoid. We cannot go into this direction because we would destroy the natural foundations of global civilization. This is what we need. And what you can see here is that in this scenario, we are consuming, have a look here, this is the business as usual path, we are consuming only half of the energy, and this is energy efficiency. So we are consuming and com producing, as in the other scenario, but much more efficiently. So less energy input for the same output, to say so, for the same services. So 50% of the solution for the problem of the energy system is energy efficiency. And the second part of the story is we need to reorganize the energy mix. It is fossil-based now. It needs to be non-fossil-based in the future. 
And if we talk about non-fossil based, this is about wind, it's about solar, it's about biomass, and if you like, it's about nuclear. As you know, this is very disputable, but I will not go into this issue. But we need to go out of this fossil fuel. So this is the fourth pillar of global civilization. And as you have been seeing, these four elements are interacting and we need to stabilize those. So if you ask me, do we need a, a post-MDG development paradigm? I would say we need urgently a post-MDG development par paradigm because we need to invest in these global development issues in international development cooperation to avoid the erosion of the four pillars of uh, global what I call the four pillars of global civilization. We will go into the second point, third point now. So I've been talking about poverty reduction, good news, several good news. I've been talking about the erosion of the four pillars of global civilization. It was soil and food, it was water, the atmosphere, and it was energy. And now I'm going into the changes, the radical ones, I call them tectonic ones, in the global economy and their impacts on these environmental changes. So let's have a look in the global economy. How is the global economy changing actually? And I brought two slides to demonstrate that. This is the first one. And the main issue here is that probably the era of Western dominance in the global economy, which started with the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago, uh, 1880, 1860, something like that, the dominance of the Western countries will be reorganized, to say so, radically. Have a look on this columns here. What you see on the left-hand side is a com comparison between the G7, so the biggest industrialized countries on the one hand side, and the E7, the emerging seven. This is, this is a graph developed by the World Bank. The E7 countries are emerging economies, and those are China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Turkey, Mexico, and Russia. I wouldn't put have Russia here for several reasons, but it's not so important. Important are what is moving the global economy. And when you look at the first column here, these are data from 2006, you can see that still the G7 countries are three times bigger in terms of their aggregated GDP, their aggregated production, than the E7 countries. Okay, so the G7 countries could argue, let's stay cool, we are three times bigger here. What is happening? Uh, then in the middle, the, the, G, G, the GDP is translated into purchase power parity. So this is what you can buy with your euro or dollar in your hand. What, is it, what the value is really about. When you compare then these two groups, you can see that the E7 countries are not as strong as the G7, G7, G7 countries still, but they are growing in importance. And then let's have a look into the future, 2050, with conservative assumptions. Here the E7 countries are growing around 3%, and the G7 countries, the industrialized countries, around 1 point something percent. And what will result of this kind of growth patterns are the columns, uh, the, third, the third pair of columns. So in 2050, the E7 countries might be as double as big in terms of GDP than the G7 countries. This is a radical shift in the global economy, a radical shift in the global economy. And this is changing the whole political panorama, the whole economic panorama. It will change, of course, development cooperation, absolutely radical. So this is a new world which we are entering in. It is the end of the dominance of the G7 countries and the OECD countries. You need to have this in mind. I do have a second picture here. Sorry, because it is in German, but I will tell you what it is about. It is, it is more or less towards 2050 the same message. So China and India becoming very important actors in the global economy. But the most important message here is, this is a long-term perspective. And what you can see here is that at the beginning, or at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, 1820 more or less, China and India have already been very important economic actors. If you go to China, if you go to India, which I do often, don't call these countries emerging countries. Don't call them emerging countries. If you wish, call them re-emerging countries. Don't call them emerging countries. People will not accept that. And they are right, because, 
Before the Industrial Revolution started, these have been global powers, obviously. And then, at the end of this half of the century, their role might be comparable with their role before the Industrial Revolution started. So, an, an hypothesis could be that the G7 countries, the OECD countries, have been the drivers and the big winners of the Industrial Revolution and the era of the nation states. It might be that these new emerging or re-emerging countries are the drivers of the globalization era. We don't know this still, but this is an hypothesis, of course. It might be. So, this is a completely different panorama which, which we are moving into. And this has, of course, impacts on the climate change issues which I have been talking uh, about before. What you can see here is that 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions from 2004 to 2030 uh, 30 are coming from China, additionally 10% from India, and this means that without these two countries, without Asia, we cannot solve the climate issue. The developing countries are right, arguing that the developed countries, the industrialized countries, we have been producing historically climate change with our greenhouse gas emissions, fossil-based growth, during 250 years, but now these countries are becoming very important drivers of climate change. So without, without these countries, there is no solution at all. And the bad news is that currently, the carbon intensity of the global economy is not shrinking. This is what we would need. The carbon intensity of the global economy needs to shrink. So more growth with less carbon emissions. What we have since 2005 is a trend into the other direction. We are moving currently, not only slow, too slow into the right direction, we are moving rapidly into the wrong direction. The carbon intensity of the global economy is growing. And this is driven by Asian growth, because Asian countries are rich by cheap coal. So this is a huge challenge for all of us. We need to bring these economies out of cheap coal-based growth. This is about technologies, this is about technological cooperation. Maya, this is actually your issue. You have to solve that. Okay. Um, I would like to, to add two additional elements here. Because I'm talking about global transformations now. I have been talking about the global transformations in the global economy, the boost of Asia and China and India on the forefront. And here I do have a second huge transformation in the global context. It is about urbanization. We are living in an era of a global urban revolution, we could say. In 2007, 50% of the global population has been living in urban areas. In 2007-2008, we peaked 50%. In 2050, 75% of people were living in urban areas. So urban development will become a very important issue for international development cooperation anyway. But what is even more important is the following data, which I found before I went to Shanghai some weeks ago to a conference on urban development, and I, and I needed to, to talk about low-carbon urbanization. So I do not know anything about urbanization, I must admit, but I know something about low-carbon, so I put the data together. And what I found is the following. In Asia, you know, this is uh, the dynamic growth of these countries. In Asia, currently, 1.5 billion people are living in cities. In only two decades' time, in 2030, 3 billion people are living, will, living, will be living in urban areas. So they will double their urban infrastructure within two decades. So why is this important? Firstly, to give you an impression, the infrastructure which is growing up now in Asia within two decades is comparable by the factor 2.5 with the infrastructure which we as Europeans all together have been building up since the Industrial Revolution, all our wars included. So this is what is emerging now in Asia in two decades. Why is this important? It is important from the climate perspective because 70% of the greenhouse gases are coming from cities. So whether in Asia these cities will be built low carbon or high carbon is absolutely crucial. If Asia goes high carbon, 
in terms of urbanization, the two degrees Celsius target is, uh, you, we can forget it easily. This is why urbanization is so important and it needs to become much more important in international development cooperation too. We had a huge debate on that in the ASEM meeting some months ago. This is the European-Asian uh, platform for international cooperation and we discussed about this urban issue and what we, what we can do to make this urbanization boost low carbon and therefore climate sensitive to say so. So this is my last point in terms of big transformational trends in the, on the global level. I've been talking about the power shift in the global economy, the E7 countries. I've been talking about urbanization. And this is now a picture from Copenhagen. This was the last night, last year. I was also there for our government as a climate advisor. We had there our laptops to calculate data, but it was not necessary to calculate any data because there was no agreement. Uh, so we had a lot of time to move around. And this is a picture from the last uh, hour when the Copenhagen Accord was brought up. We did not get a climate regime, but we did get a two-paper sheet where some data are put together and it's not international law. So this people formulated the Copenhagen Accord. What I would like to show you only is that there is no, no European round the table. No European round the table. So what I want to say here is that we as Europeans need to bring our forces and capacities and knowledge and policies and financial flows together to play a role in international arenas. This is what I want to say. We have been hearing from the European Commission um, colleague that 60% of international development cooperation is coming from Europe. But we do not play a political strong role on the international level. This is Copenhagen and we are not around the table. This is something, this is a challenge for us, you know. I think we have to learn in this world which is changing so radically in terms of economic power structures, the E7 picture, we have to learn that we as Europeans, we are all medium and small scale countries. All. All. And only together we can move something. So I am a strong, convinced European and I hope you are that too. So I'm coming to my last, I uh, should, should I? Maya, how I'm in time or what's, it's fine still? Okay, good. <laughs> how much time would you give me? How many? 15. Good. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to shrink it together now because my feeling was that I'm running out of time. So if you um, allow me, I will need this uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So if you put all these kind of things together, what you come up with are some elements of a new development paradigm. Because I have been arguing that the sheer orientation towards, power, uh, towards uh, poverty alleviation, the MDG system, is not enough. Because we can achieve these MDG goals and easily destroy our four pillars of global civilization. So what we need is a new set of uh, criteria, criteria for a global development paradigm which is sustainable. And here you can see some of the elements. We have been seeing that we need a low carbon energy system. So resource efficiency is absolutely key in the future. And we should formulate indicators and targets for that. I do have a third element here. I think we need to reflect on lifestyles and wealth concepts. We do have a, a discussion on that. Is GDP the only indicator to measure economic wealth? I don't think so. There are different alternatives for that. So it is about wealth concept. How do we, how do we interpret and define quality of life in a world with planetary boundaries? This is a huge shift in thinking in our mental maps, I think, because industrialization was about growing without limits. It was making us free from the environmental boundaries. And what we are take, have to take into account now is we need to organize wealth and growth and poverty reduction within the planetary boundaries because we are very nearby to touch them. So this is the third element. It is about lifestyles and world's concepts. We will need global governance for that. This is about, if you talk about resource efficiency, about food security, of course this is about investing in countries. 
and changing policies in many countries. But we need global cooperation for that because climate change is global and urbanization is global and migration is global. So we need global cooperation by that, uh, for that in order to make our international cooperation patterns um, sustainable. And the last point here is that if we are talking about, as we are talking about scarcity, uh, this is about access to scarce resources, and this is then at the end of the day about fairness and about justice. I think we need this normative discussion worldwide. Because at the end of the day, if you think about a continuum, there are only two solutions. If you have this kind of scarcities, the first solution is conflicts. You know? Scarce resources, so who has access? access to it, others don't have exit, access to it. This is about di dynamics of conflicts. On the other side of the di continuum, you need to organize cooperation around fairness and justice. If we don't go into the second avenue, we will live in a very insecure, unstable and conflictive world order. This is for sure. So this is why we need also development cooperation, because from, from my perspective, development cooperation is not only helping physically to say so, so infrastructure, roads or schools. International cooperation for me is also an investment in the, let's call it social capital of the emerging global society. And we need this kind of social capital, not only in our societies, we need this internationally because the situation is as, from my perspective, as I have been describing it. So these are elements for a new development paradigm there. I'm coming slowly uh, to the end. We will skip that. And I would like to finish... Yeah, I will finish with that. I would like to finish with the climate issue because we do have the Cancun meeting now and we will probably not see successes. Uh, I would like to show you that institutionally, politically, there would be a relatively easy solution for that. Our government, the German government, have been asking us, us is now the German Advisory Council on Global Change, they have been asking us in 2007-8, please design a global climate regime which is based on fairness, because if not, it will not work, it will not be accepted, which is economically efficient and which is transparent and relatively easy in terms of parameters you, you are playing with. So we did that, and I would like to show you rapidly how it could look like. So uh, I think this uh, could be a, an easy solution, actually, of course, with huge consequences for how to reorganize the global economy afterwards. So what would it look like? What might it look like if we could organize the political power for it? Uh, Europe and South Korea, maybe India and China together. The U.S. is a difficult partner, but we need partners to bring this through. So how could it look like? The idea is the following. What we some, mathematic, some people who like mathematics uh, around here. So uh, the, the government asked us for simple solutions. We came up with this um, formula here to shock them a bit, you know, to, to show them that things are very difficult, and, but we do have an easy solution. As you will see, here are only four parameters. What we have been looking for first is, you remember we had this, global greenhouse gas budget, 750 gigatons, okay? So our question is how to distribute the global greenhouse gas budget. We need a burden sharing formula. This has to do with justice and this has to do with afterwards organizing emission trading very easily. So this is the burden sharing formula and what is in the burden sharing formula is simply that. So this is easy, isn't it? So these are only four things which we need, where we need global consensus. We need global consensus regarding the two degrees Celsius target. We already have that actually. And we need to define the probability to reach this target. I have been calculating with you together the 67% uh, probability, probability budget. You can calculate it with 50% if you go for a risky path. So we need agreement on that two degrees and probability to agree, uh, to reach, to achieve the two degrees Celsius target. This is the first thing. We do have a second thing, which is very important from a developing country perspective. This is about 
historical responsibility of countries for climate change. Because developing countries are arguing with very good reasons that industrialized countries started to emit fossil fuels, burn fossil fuels, uh, hundreds of years ago. And China started 20 years ago. So how do we factor in our, our re historical responsibility? China says we need to calculate all the Western emissions in starting in 1820, so Industrial Revolution. We argue that we should start with the historical responsibility in 1990. In many, country, in many countries around the world agree on that. Why 1990? Two important reasons for that. The first reason is that in 1990, the first IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change report, has been published demonstrating that A, climate change is dangerous, and second, it is driven by human beings. So we, we, did have, we didn't had evidence, scientific evidence for that before. If we didn't have evidence for that, you cannot be made responsible for something which, we did, which you did not know. So the first argument for 1990. The second argument for 1990 is that in 1992 we had the Rio conference, the Earth Summit. Some of you might remember it, others might have been reading something about the Earth Summit in 1992. There all leaders, global leaders, shared the vision that climate change is a threat to human mankind. So we argue for 1990 as a limit for historical uh, responsibility. There is a third issue then which we need to clarify. And the question is, which kind of distribution formula should we base our decision on, the decision on in terms of how to distribute the 750 gigatons which we as a human society still have available in terms of emissions. And our answer is very easy and actually our Chancellor is in favor of that and the Prime Minister of India is in favor of that. Equal per capita rights. So every person on earth has the same rights in terms of emissions. We think this is the only robust fairness criteria because poor countries will never ever accept that rich countries have the right to emit three times, four times, ten times, 50 times more than poor countries. Why should they? So we think this is the only robust uh, fairness criteria. This is the third thing here. And then we have a fourth thing that we need to agree on. This is about population growth. So we will be 9 billion people in 2050. We are 6.7 now. How do we factor population growth in? Population growth is taking place in developing countries. So we, uh, we suggested to work with the current population data to have an incentive to, to manage population growth. We can discuss this, but this is the fourth element where we need consensus on. Many countries around the world agree on that. We have been working this out with Chinese co colleagues. We did this with Chinese colleagues to bring the discussion a bit forward. So these are the four elements where we need agreement on. If you put the data into the formula, which we have been seeing before, into this formula, you are coming up with national budgets for every country on earth. So based on these agreements, on these four criteria, you then get for every country a national budget. And then you start emission trading. And if you are a high emitter, there is a huge incentive to emit less because you need to buy certificates from other countries. It's costful. And this is what economic incentives are about. And if you are a poor country and have a huge carbon budget which you can sell, it's also an incentive to emit even less because you can sell that on the markets. You can get rich by being carbon efficient. And this is the idea here, to write carbon efficiency into the global economic system. So if you do that, bring all the data into this formula, you can up, come up with a list with the national, with the national um, carbon budgets then. And the only thing we are going to look at here is the last column there. And what you can see here is, if you do that with the data which I suggested, you can see in the last column how long the national budgets last, which you will get based on this formula. And what you can see here is that our budget, Germany, our budget will be exhausted in 10 years. So then we need to buy certificates. This implies that the incentive to go for low carbon development would be huge. Because if not, we have to buy certificates. 
For the US it's even more difficult, it's only six years. For Brazil it's 24 years. You can see here that even Brazil is already in a difficult situation. We are all in a difficult situation. If we came, when we came up with this data, we were very astonished actually, because even emerging economies are already emitting much more than they can. Because from now on to 2050, we all, on average, can only emit 2.7 tons per capita per year. In Germany, we are emitting 10 tons. In the European Union, we are emitting 9 tons. The US is emitting 20 tons. African countries are emitting 0.5 tons. So this is what you came up with. And based on these national budgets, we organize emission trading then. And I will not go into the details now. We think that this is a big, would be a big shift towards climate sensitive and sustainable development. We will not see this now in uh, Cancun, obviously, but I hope that we move step by step into this direction. And meanwhile, we, stu we move step by step into this direction. What we can do now is working on national levels towards low carbon development. And we need to, need, need to do that in all our countries, also in developing countries. And as we have seen, many developing countries are growing rapidly. So the biggest energy plants will be built during the next decades, not in OECD countries, in developing countries. So we need to go all for low carbon. And I will finish my presentation with some impressions what low carbon is actually about. What, what are we talking about when, when we say that we need to build up low carbon economies? What is that? So let's have a look. We will shift that. Low carbon. The last three, four slides, I think. So, avoiding dangerous climate change. Meanwhile, we still do not have this global climate regime, but we all can do a lot at the national level organizing low carbon development. This is here from uh, McKinsey. They tell, uh, tell us that low carbon is about energy efficiency. It's about low carbon energy supply. This is what we have already been seeing. It is about land use change. This is about forests. We need to protect our forests. And it is about behavioral change. I have been talking about new wealth concepts. So these are the areas where we need activities. Then you can see that we need to make progress in all our industrial sectors. The low carbon economy is not one sector. It's not only energy. We need to bring down our carbon emissions in each and every sec sector which we have. And we can do that because the technologies, fortunately, in many sectors are already there. Technologically, we can move into this direction. So the low carbon economy is not only one sector. The low carbon economy is an economy as such. And this is a challenge for our economies in Europe. But we need to bring this thinking into development cooperation. And it is still not there. It is still not there. We are focusing on poverty reduction. We are not focusing on we need to organize low carbon development per se. So, um, some impressions. And the main point here is we do have many <coughs> low carbon pilots, actually. So if you move through Germany, for example, you will see many of these windmills. But these are still pilots, you know. The energy system as such is dominated by high carbon energy productions. We need to come from pilots to systems. From pilots to systems. In wind energy, it is possible now. You can see here windmills from 1980. And you can see here the windmills which are in production and development towards 2020. And compare the windmills from 2000, the, 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 the volume of the turbines, with the windmills in 2020, which are already under construction. So you can see that we have been working with windmills which, has, which had windmills around 112 meters. We are constructing currently ones with 250 to 300 meters. So these are wind machines offshore, and the electricity which is coming out of it is coming out with a factor by 5 to 20, comparing one windmill with the other. So here we are doing the step from pilots to systems, obviously. So it is about energy, it is about wind things, and it is about solar also. As you know, we do have this discussion about linking our energy system with North Africa. This could be very important for international cooperation. I would like to see 
that Desertec, the cooperation between Europe and Africa on energy supply towards low carbon energy supply becomes a cornerstone of European development cooperation. And we should then not only build energy infrastructure towards Europe, we should also build in energy infrastructures towards Africa, southern, southern Africa of course, because 60% of the African population do not have access to uh, modern energy, 60%. So this is not sustainable in time. And we can solve the problem because solar power plants, for example, today are more efficient economically than the inefficient energy production based on unmodern biomass burn in sub-Saharan Africa. So we can skip that. And this is again about, these are some impressions about low carbon development. No? And this is about cities. I have been talking about the urbanization thing. And here is a nice story. It could be that the city story, which is a huge challenge and threat now, because 70% of our greenhouse gases are coming from cities, this could translate into a solution. Because we can build now worldwide um, houses and buildings which do not consume energy, but uh, produce energy. So we could build cities where the houses are not consumers of energy, but where these houses and cities could become decentralized power plants. Think on that. So translating a problem, consuming huge energy volumes, into a solution, producing energy. I think these are future orientations which we need to reflect on. So this is the last picture then. Technology is important, finance is important, cooperation is important, but at the end of the day, lifestyle also matters. So thank you very much for your patience.